And we are live. Uh, we are at NMC 16, uh, and we're talking to Brian Alexander, Autumn, and Helen, and Brian's wife as well, so she can Redway. introduce herself. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so we'll, we'll let you guys introduce yourselves there on site. Hey, everybody. Hi, how you doing? Um, I'm Autumn Keynes with Virtually Connecting, and uh, just really excited to be here. Uh, Helen, why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Helen DeWard, and again, very excited to be uh, sharing time and space with virtual buddies from all over the place. I'm, I'm Rum Puentitura. I'm an independent education consultant, and I'm the creator of the SAMR model and the Tech Quintet for studying how to best use technology in education. And I'm Karedwin Alexander. I'm Brian's ch uh, Chief Operating Officer. Uh, I'm Brian Alexander, and uh, I do stuff for the future of education and technology. I have more hair than anybody on this call. This is true. Great. Uh, thanks, guys. And let's go ahead and introduce the people who are with us virtually. We can start with um, Carolyn. You want to introduce yourself and then... Or Chuck, why don't you jump in there? All right. Um, I'm Chuck Pearson. I'm an incoming associate professor of natural sciences at Tusculum College. Until such a time, I will remain geek as large and be proud of it. Nice. How about Darcy? You want to introduce yourself? I think Carolyn's having a bit of a problem with technology, so uh, we'll give her a couple seconds. Hi, I'm DRC Hutchings. I'm the Instructional Design Librarian at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And um, Brian, I actually um, read much of your book on digital storytelling in my um, last semester class with uh, Skip Via. Um, so know your name there and had some Twitter conversations with you before. But Thank you glad for saying to, Yeah, glad to, to be here and happy to hear what you have to say today. Sue? Hi, I'm Sue Beckingham and I'm from Sheffield in the UK. So it's night time here and it's torrenting down with rain and um, I think I'm going to start building an ark soon because <laughs> it doesn't stop raining. Um, so I teach in the um, Department of Computing, um, not so much on the techie side but more on um, communication professional skills, digital marketing, um, that's, that sort of thing. Really pleased to be here. And Caroline, do you want to try to introduce yourself again there? I think you're connected now. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, yeah, I'm Caroline and I am also in the UK in Bath in a beautiful city and I am a PhD student in educational technology. I'm trying to find out about the power of self-crafted personal learning environments for students. Welcome. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sunday and I'm in Wisconsin and this is a nice international group here. So I know that the on-site people don't have much time because they have to rush off to a fancy uh, reception. So <laughs> maybe we'll start with them and just uh, get some, some reflections of the day and, and what's been exciting and is there anything you want to share with us? If you're going to talk about fancy receptions, we're going to have to talk about the epic survival horror experience of our hotel. Oh, yes. this is a great story. Okay, so, yeah. so it yeah. began on Sunday, the day before the conference, when someone was shot and killed in our hotel. Yes. Not kidding. Then uh, this morning, there was a fire alarm uh, because, how did this work now? We're still trying to piece this together. Um, but basically, they ordered everyone out of the hotel because the uh, a whole pile of water fell into one room well, and flooded I it out. I think a fire alarm went off, and then the sprinklers the sprinkler started. Yeah. And that was the room next to ours. And then uh, on top of this, the the wireless is well, well. The technical term from computer science is what crap. <laughs> I believe that is the yes. formal term. Yes. 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 And uh, and then we found out there were at least two elevators that seemed to be haunted. Uh, that uh, have imaginary ideas about what floor you're on and it's optional whether or not they go to the button, the floor that you press the and button for. And every so often you can feel the braking gauge. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I, I think we deserve a fancy reception, just as a kind of like survival, you know. Thing. Um, this is what happens when you start talking about robots and and artificial intelligence, isn't it? Like, yeah. Aren't, aren't no, you, because no. I always talk about robots and artificial intelligence. So <laughs> you know, never happened before. No, everything happens, you know. But uh, so the conference so far, uh, what did you guys think? What are some of your impressions? I, hands down, the town hall meeting and hearing the voices from people around the room um, and, you know, different perspectives from different parts of the globe, um, all connected to NMC, really, really impacted for me. And, of course, Brian's session yesterday, three hours with Brian Alexander, what could be better? <laughs> I love her. Yeah. I have to second that too. Hey. Um, I've never seen uh, I've never seen Brian do the um, the work that he does in the workshops, and it was just really amazing and um, made me once again realize how important imagination is in our world mm. and in mm. what we what we do every single day. And, and people forget that, and and sometimes we need to be reminded. And Brian is one of those kinds of people who can help remind us. So I was very thankful for that. Well, now I'm just gonna blush. <laughs> Um, thank you both. <laughs> Gosh, um, uh, I, I want to second both of what the, what uh, these two fine women said. One is that the uh, town hall meeting was very passionate, very engaged. Uh, it was mostly the people in the NMC community who were talking to the board about what they wanted and what they saw. And then, um, yeah, imagination is definitely a huge theme. People are really keen on that. How about you, Ruben? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that have been great, and I agree with you wholeheartedly about the town hall, have been the conversations throughout mm -hmm. uh, the conference. You know, I think all of the different events have triggered additional conversations in the corridors, in breaks, during the sessions that have been truly wonderful. So, for instance, just from the town hall, uh, you know, just the conversations that uh, went on in the next two sessions mm. uh, really played off of that, where people were saying, well, gee, we started thinking about what's the future of NMC, mm -hmm. but now we can start to see that thinking that we did there suddenly spills over into what digital literacy is all about, what mm -hmm. sustainability in technology and education is all about, so it's been really quite wonderful. It's a good example of how you know some of these futures work just unpick so many different threads at once. Where's, where's NMC going to go, and that connects to this other idea and this other idea. That's excellent. That's excellent. So have you been following the Twitter stream for the conference at all? Notice any trends? Any Are they cutting out for everyone else? Yeah. Okay, on site folk, I you might we might have lost you. Can we uh, hear you back again? Hear you. There was a little glitch, but we can still hear you. Can you hear us? I think we can hear you now. Yeah. You're back. Yes. Okay. So anyone following the Twitter stream? Yeah, so Russell, what did you guys see on the Twitter stream that uh, that was interesting? I saw a lot of stuff yesterday following all the VR stuff and I'm and I'm constantly looking at that and trying to figure out how to approach it because I'm still quite confused at how we take something so sugary and it looks nice and it's exciting in itself and then how do how do we approach that to use it in a a, a real way and so I mean it sounded like people were having those conversations but you couldn't quite see um, exactly what what that was so I don't know if that was just the first day or um, if that continued on the second day, yeah. Anyone else? Chuck is saying that he wasn't on Twitter at all, so he's not going to be able to to say anything. <laughs> That's okay too. Yeah, I was going to say if you look at the NMC hashtags, actually, it's been really co quite interesting to see some of the riffing that's taken place, which, again, to me, is always one of the best parts of the Twitter stream, not just the summary or commentary, but people saying, wait, you can take this in this direction, that direction. So I think I'm going to have a fun time 
you know, after the conference is over, going back over the Twitter stream archives and following up on all the different strands. I think there's lots of good material there. <laughs> Brian, maybe you could tell us, I feel like you've been associated with NMC for a while. Could you tell us that story? How did you first get associated with them, and what's the, what's the story there? It's a weird story, uh, and it may be unique. Type in your Twitter handle. Um, starting in 2001, I was working with a nonprofit that worked with about 200 small liberal arts colleges and universities in the U.S., and uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was connect those schools to the larger world of technology and education. So we uh, introduced them to different associations and events, and one of them was uh, NMC. So I think this was about a couple of years after uh, Larry took over NMC and started redesigning it, mm -hmm. uh, roughly. And so uh, we all got together and uh, nightly staff and about 20 people all came to an NMC conference. And so for about five years, there was a relationship where we go to the annual conference, and then we started doing other things together. And, and that was pretty interesting. And then uh, the nonprofit nightly stopped working closely with NMC, but I had an informal relationship, so I would come every so often. Um, along the way, I got on the Horizon board and started doing Horizon work all the time, presenting on Horizon, talking about Horizon, chairing the board one time. Um, so... And then now, in a fit of lunacy, NMC asked me to keynote the mm -hmm. conference this year. Um, so that's, that's an unusual, that's, I think that's a weird story, maybe unique. Um, but thank you for asking. Yeah, you know, one of the things that sticks out to me about this conference, it came up in um, the last uh, session with Gardner, is that there's not, there's not a vendor floor. Which is awesome. Right. <laughs> the first time I went to an NMC conference, I remember uh, they had, uh, I want to say, four vendors. Mm -hmm. and there was Adobe, Apple, those are the two I remember, there are two others I think. And um, I was used to the Educause vendor floor where you enter a room and the horizon curves away to their sides. There are thousands of vendors. And the vendors are represented by, by flunkies, right? You know, they're, they're sales reps usually. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you get like a brief glimpse of a brochure and then you move on or there's a little swag and you bounce off. Um, but I was amazed I could sit down with Adobe's head of education and have a conversation for 20 minutes. Yeah. And wow. Yeah, it, was, it was very in-depth. I mean, if I were buying then, you know, stuff from Adobe, that would have really pushed me that way, so that's successful marketing, but I learned a lot more about what they wanted, they learned a lot more about what we were doing, so mm -hmm. that was terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just find that to be a, a real win. Yeah, because there's vendors here, but it's just that there's not a vendor floor. Right. And they have sponsors, There's but... one big vendor booth in the front. Okay. Uh, Miramar? Sure. That's right. Um, and that's about it. But I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that it seems like it's more focused on people and relationships and conversations than yes. on, look at, I got the bigger banner and we're number one, <laughs> you know? And I don't know, maybe you guys could speak a little bit. Um, have you guys seen that at other conferences? I just feel like so many conferences I go to are so uh, vendor-driven these days. Which ones? Like, uh, Educon? Educon is a big one. I don't know if I want to like, call out specific ones, but yeah. yeah I think um, one, of the, I think one of the big differences with MC and perhaps some other conferences is that the vendors are here more as partners, okay. and, and it doesn't just mean, you know, sort of partners, but really we're just paying the bills and putting an ad yeah. into the conference. They really are here, as you said, they, to talk with the people who are doing interesting things, and that was all the way back, you know, I've been with NMC as a founding partner, so mm. I, I go all, all the way back to the beginning of the organization, and I remember in the first meetings, you know, you had the corporate partners, but it wasn't, okay, let's push our wares. It was more, uh -huh. you know, we've got all this neat stuff that nobody's doing anything really dramatically different or interesting with it. Can you guys do something interesting with it? Mm -hmm. And that's remained the key focus, you know. So, so there's a real partnership. It's not, yeah, you guys are going to buy this. That, that's not the point. The point is not to have you buy our stuff and sell competitors. The point is, what are you doing that's interesting? And, well, and then that does lead to marketing down the road. But, of course, right. but, but this but, is very different from show up and sign up for our list, and you know, and we can bombard you. Right. Yeah. Nobody scanned my badge. <laughs> I, I could scan it now if you want, just if you feel neglected. You know. um, okay. Yeah. So the the keynote address this morning uh, from Constant Steincooler, I thought was was really great. Uh, it sounded a theme that has been around at MC for a while on different levels, but uh, it was a huge pay on to gaming and education. And uh, I was really pleased to see both her, her classic work on teen boys and uh, 
uh, literacy and games, but also updated for her work with um, uh, the White House on gaming and learning, and uh, just some fascinating research. I was always glad when a keynote shows research and not just you know bromides, but showed data, um, and it was very inspiring. I think Autumn, you and I were the only ones who, when she said. You know, if educators aren't thinking about equity, you're not doing the job right. But yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but it was, uh, um, yeah, I thought really solid, very, very exciting. It was such a good one. It really was. Yeah. yeah. Go back through the Twitter stream and, and just see what came out of Constance's talk, because the this, this stream was very active when yeah. she was doing her keynote this morning. Yeah. From, um, 9, 10 o'clock, 10.30. Check the stream in that time frame. Yeah. And I think we probably will want to cut this kind of short because, like I said, we do have we only have, we have so buses much time. to catch. We have buses mm -hmm. to catch. But does anybody have any last comments or questions before we go? Sue or Darcy, anything you want to know? They're they're just happy to. We have a little bit of dead air. It's a conversation. It's not a show. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> and what we saw Juan kind of jumped in, and then and then we lost him. So I guess Juan, uh, I wasn't yeah. sure. Okay. Oh, yeah, he, he, he did make it for for a bit there, but um, he just wanted to listen. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, I um I have um the impression that the whole um, idea of personalization in the US is quite different than the one at least in the UK and I would say in European research it's a bit different and I am wondering because I know you have um, some things about LMS and PLE and thinking about if I got you right I think that you um, in a way, think that the PLE is, I don't know what's the word, if it's uh, more powerful than the VLE. Is there anything you would maybe, in one sentence or two, as you don't have many much time, that you would say it's worth to look into if you're doing, if you're interested in PLEs or in personal learning environments. I, I was wondering about yours, as you are a futurist, what is kind of your future view about that? Uh, I'll give it a quick whack, but then let me defer to my uh, colleagues here. Um, I think you, you see a lot of drives of personalization in the U.S. from different reasons. Um, you see state governments pushing this because in many parts of the U.S., our K through 12 population is dwindling. Uh, so our primary and secondary school populations are getting smaller, which means, among other things, it's easier to personalize if there are fewer students. But this also leads to a kind of increased ethos of care, uh, especially when it comes to undergraduate education. Uh, if there's a smaller pool of students, then we can compete with each other by being ever more personal. That can really hail people. And while American tuition continues to soar higher and higher, which means, among other things, student and family expectations follow that up. Well, if we're paying twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year for education, my God, young Susie or Jimmy's got to get some personal attention, and that kind of goes together. Uh, the second is this is a way of of talking about uh, data collection, data analytics. So if uh, mm -hmm. If you're going to be monitoring the data exhaust of students as they go through an LMS or tracking them on social media or whatever, uh, on the one hand, you're supposed to depersonalize it. It's supposed to be aggregated for some sense of privacy. But you can also personalize it so you can better track what happens to Susie and Jimmy as they go through Biology 101 and then move on to Psychology or whatever. Uh, you know, a third reason is a sense of appealing to, uh, to rising generations, to millennials, and then below that to Generation uh, Z or the whole man generation, whatever we call them, uh, the sense that this is a generation that really responds to personalization, sees themselves in really individualistic ways, um, and so this is a way of meeting them where they are. I mean, so those those are three quick foci from the uh, from the U.S. side. Uh, we don't really have a national movement for this I mean, because we don't really have national education anything. Um, I mean, our new Secretary of Education actually gave a terrific speech where he accused higher ed of fomenting a caste system. Uh, I thought it was terrific. Uh, I don't think the presidents who heard that were quite as impressed. Um, what would you guys add where personalization is in the U.S.? One thing I would add is the question of something that, again, it has to do with the U.S. perspective, which is the current drive towards personalization comes also from connections with earlier drives towards individualized 
learning and differentiated learning. Mm. And one of the key elements that has come into the picture now in the U.S. more clearly with this evolution has been the fact that the previous two drives were still very much focusing on the instructor and what the instructor does. The latest drive towards personalized learning focuses more, I would argue, on what the student does or decides. And, and again, there's multiple branches. For instance, you have uh, Bill McGarvey's uh, massively customized uh, learning, which uh, leans heavily on all the technology, the analytics direction, but that's a heavily personalized rather than aggregated direction to provide the student with the tools necessary to direct. So that's a different direction than the earlier individualized learning, which was much more what can I as the teacher or I as the institution do for you, the student, to design for you, me, the institution, me, the teacher, and experience. So that's an evolution we're seeing right now. And I think we're at a transitional moment. In other words, that's the way things are going, but it's not settled down into it definite pattern, and I'm seeing a lot of branching in different directions right. stemming from that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a thought that would that's great. add to the mix. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing I would add is one concern that I've had in this area, and it comes back to that focus on analytics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where um, I see a lot of data being uh, collected on students in the name of personalization, mm -hmm. but students at the end of the day don't end up owning that Great. data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a big that's problem. Mm -hmm. And I've sat in in you know meetings with people, and whenever I come down to the question, okay, it's wonderful that we have all this data on these students. Now, how does the student? What's the interface? What does mm -hmm. it look like? How does the student? Oh, well, the student doesn't really doesn't really access that data. Well, why well, not? And and one of the things I I I um are on the discussion is about this. The, for example, the having students their own domain is they deciding with whom they share the data and what they share and what they share. So it's all about, I think, at the end, if one could try to empower students to be really more critical to and show them in a way or at least expose them to more critical thinking in relation with what they share and with whom they share and if they want to share it or if they don't, I think we would be a bit more thinking about students' perspective and how they can really be empowered and not just data source for whatever means that will be. Yeah, uh, absolutely right. I, I think I think you guys have identified a huge problem that, that we may have started moving from the faculty member essential to the student, but we're still not, we're not fully there. And partly at the K-12 level, we're crazy about curriculum and assessment, which in many ways kind of leaves the faculty and the students alone. It's a kind of third party. Um, and the higher ed perspective, um, insofar as we have full-time faculty, those vanishingly rare unicorns, uh, they, have, um, mm. they have many other things, many other pressures. Um, and again, curriculum still really matters. Uh, the ownership, the thing about students accessing their own data just always flummoxes me because I think it feels the same at the primary school level as it does at the graduate school mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. like, okay, let's just say a third grader mm -hmm. I could see an argument for a third grader not having access to their data. I mean, I would disagree. I think they should get it in pre-K. But, but, you know, but I could see that, right? But a 25-year-old, you know, an right. adult, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, um, I mean, we're in this really weird period where we are thinking, rethinking privacy very, very hard. Um, and we are, you know, possibly we're seeing new politics come out of that. I mean, I'm thinking in the wake of the Orlando shooting, it was really impressive to see both leading presidential candidates call for curtailing civil liberties. Um, mm -hmm. Different ways, mm -hmm. different right. ways, um, but um, both want to increase surveillance. Uh, wow, okay, you know, that's, um, that's a total system. Well, I don't want to distract mm -hmm. so much. <laughs> This, uh, this also reminds me, just really quickly, of uh, Future Trends Forum um, that you did with George Siemens recently. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I wanted to loop that in. I just wanted to say that because you're doing a Future Trends Forum from here tomorrow. Tomorrow, yep. So tune into that. There's another opportunity to interact with Brian and with the NMC conference because he's going to be doing a, a Future Trends Forum from, from here. So I think that's kind of cool. Well, thank just you. just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the link will be on Twitter uh, as well as on my blog. And uh, you guys can... Uh, chime in, follow along, ask questions, make faces. Uh, we have uh, at least three people who have agreed to come in, and uh, we'll have to maybe have to tase them to keep them in place. <laughs> this is a this is a very energetic conference. There's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, Ruben mentioned conversations, and things are really bubbling. 
Um, um, do you mean it's one can um, go online, assist to your workshop? Because I was reading about your workshop. Is that is that a possibility? Yes, this is different. Um, my workshops do have Google Docs, which you can uh, poke into and edit and copy yeah, and, yeah. and do all kinds of stuff. Uh, but the Future Transform is a live video conference uh, where anybody can participate with uh, asking questions out loud or by texting or you know it's uh, or of course on Twitter. Thank you for okay, asking. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll be there. You. We're gonna have to run, you guys. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Please continue the conversation amongst yourselves, but we're gonna run. Right. Enjoy. I I see somebody putting on a tiger suit at the the Magic Center, so I don't know what's oh, going to happen wow. there. <laughs> oh, dear. Better, better see if we can catch the last bus. It's like they're shining. <laughs> Bye, Take care, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay, so how do people feel around for sticking around for a few more minutes and, and digging a little deeper into some of the stuff mentioned there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm about all our data. For yeah? Mm-hmm. I'm happy um, to stick around. I don't know how much I have to offer to the conversation, mm -hmm. but maybe I'll come up with something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely something that we continue to talk about here at my small school is, you know, how to empower students and how to get them interested in it in, in their own way so that we're not forcing them to care about their data, that they're actually caring about it, right? So... Um, well, anyone, I was very yeah. grateful to Carolyn for um, asking the questions. I'm really sorry she had so much trouble with the connectivity because I think she could have pushed that conversation forward earlier. Um, the, and, and yes, we do have um, issues with data running all around. The question I was going to throw in front of Brian, and I might just throw it on Twitter, is um, who's driving this? Um, because um, because we've said, um, he said, um, this is not really something that students are asking for. And to the extent I've been able to observe this on faculty side, it's not really something that we're emphatic that, yes, we have to have this. So um, so, um, so, the, the drivers are the thing that's really interesting to me. And to what extent um, my personal response to it is to um, go back to small liberal arts college land and leave the state institution where I've been for the last two years, but you can do that when you're on temporary contracts. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm wondering other responses. Um, if, if I can say about, I think there is, a, well, hidden, I don't know if it's really hidden or not, but I do think it isn't hidden. There is a hidden agenda, and I was hearing, um, if, if you're interested, just um, sharing that with you, there is um, this woman called Ursula Franklin, and she is um, in the Messy Lectures um, webpage. I can put the link now, I sure. would put it. And sure. she has six podcasts about, she's talking about the real world of technology. Mm -hmm. And what she is really saying there is the whole... Um, yeah, the whole politics of technology, how other people and power structure really benefit with their decisions, their mm -hmm. own power structures. And I think that their learning analytics and all of this personalization from that mm -hmm. data and analytics point of view is really a, politic ag a political agenda. I am, mm -hmm. I do think so. And, and and that's why I am interested in students' voice, because I do think students need mm -hmm. to be more critical and not just, you know, jump with that unconscious, yeah, I don't know, slave of politics in a way, yeah. don't wanting but being. So I do think, yes, there is um, a need to be more critical, I think. I always have to interrupt at these points and say, yes, my last name is Pearson. No relation. <laughs> um, <laughs> There was the piece that um, that Wired magazine put together um, about um, Pearson Pearson PLC putting all of their different tentacles into education, um, not merely in um, Western Europe and the United States, but in developing countries, um, simply in the interest of 
through one means or another, gaining a market share. Um, and of course, we're always bothered when um, when we see education become a function of market share rather than a function of it per engagement between people. So, um, and so we do have reasons to be concerned. We have each of us, I'm sure, in our own institutions, have made observations of bargains that are being made. Um, I agree, it's a political agenda, Carolyn, but I think it's um, there's not there's no hidden behind it except hey, all the money that there is going, um, and that's uh, that's a primary motivator, especially on. In this part of the world, behind um, a lot of the decisions that get made on where we post the, the learning management system we use to post course materials, the um, textbook providers we engage with, and such as that. I think the question about what's driving it at, at institutions, uh, and then going back to what Carolyn said about power and those kind of being. Two of the same things, but then also, you know, we're trying, you know, as a technologist, I'm trying to drive it to kind of fight against that larger power. But but it is it is something to to think about. And I, and for me, a way that I try to kind of approach it is opening up ways for faculty and students to explore these things and make their own decisions about them. Mm -hmm. Is, is kind of a way to do it so that there's not driving, but rather just creating opportunities for the conversations mm -hmm. to happen, for the um, experiences being in online spaces and looking at data and looking at your own data and, and figuring those things out, I think is, is you know, a way to approach it. I don't know. And if I may ask you, because I'm um, in my research at the moment, I am really struggling to get students involved in crafting their their personal learning environments. They, it's just a thing that um, if you propose that to them, they just look at you like say, um, you know, am I no? I'm not doing this. It's too complicated, or why bother? Or this is not what I came here for. Um, I came here because you're the expert and you have information to communicate. Why are you asking me, the student, to explore on my own terms when you know everything? Um, then there's our fallacy, of course. And you know, the, the other thing is there is this liminal space where you don't know what you are doing. It is uncomfortable. You're struggling with the unknown. You don't want to be in that space. I can understand that. But I think that's the only space where change happens. So I'm really worried, more than my own research, is this really difficulty to engage students in to be in that space. And, and then after, let's say, six months, they have gained really something really valuable for the rest of their life. So how, so my question is to you when you say you're offering those opportunities, how do you do those? So, I mean, an example of how do you do that would be maybe maybe useful to just yeah maybe take some. Um, so this is a very small example, but one of the things that I've really liked lately in terms of starting this conversation is the David White uh, typology of visitor resident mm -hmm. and mapping. I, I don't know who's familiar with that or not, mm -hmm. but mapping your digital practices. Yeah, so I'm using I think that. yeah, it's a great way to start that conversation with faculty and students because it then brings it personally to them on this spectrum of what's personal, what's not, where do those lines cross, what's institutional, what's not, you know, where are you actually leaving a trace, where are you not and then you can start conversations about well where do you want to be is that do you think your whole life you're just gonna you know use the digital for just personal things like is that the kind of of um, you know mark or life you want to live in this space and I, I think it creates those conversations that need to happen um, for me for faculty I usually um, 
try to create space, safe spaces for them to play around with things that they haven't done, like help them, uh, you know, get into live Twitter chats if they've never done that, uh, those kind of things. And, you know, I think small, small ways is, yeah. is uh -huh. kind of my approach. I don't know if th those are concrete enough ideas for, for you or yeah, if anyone well, I else have has you others. I have using the, the visitor and resident approach for my research with 20 students that I, I have. Um, it's brilliant, but I'm still struggling to move them further, to just say, okay, we are in this space, and, and how can we, for example, in my case, my 20 participants, in the quadrant, which is the resident and the institutional space. So what do I use at the university to study and which digital tools I engage with? It's very empty and only the institutional tools are there. So I was kind of saying to them, hey, would, would, would maybe an interesting thing be, can we move, can we populate more this space? Are you interested in that? Do you want to explore? And then they say, yes, we want. But then when you actually say, okay, let's have a session and then they kind of, oh, well, oh, I don't know. So, yeah, you're right. It's just small initiatives, and you have to be perseverant, I think, and just continue and find ways to just, yeah, I think it, it, it just, it, if I hear you and I say, okay, it's everyone is struggling with the same thing, and oh, it makes yes. me feel better, yeah. Um, I'm starting to um, teach upper division um, molecular and cellular biology this fall for the first time in um, over a decade. And um, and there's going to be an element that I um, approach this with where I'm going to ask the students to get on Twitter and um, seek out conversations, um, have conversations with one another, um, and trade resources, which I think, I, I think the most powerful thing you can do on Twitter is trade resources with one another and share. Um, but with that said, there's going to be a recognition that um, my students, when they use Twitter, they tend to use it um, a little bit sillier than I tend to use it, and I can be pretty silly. Um, there are a host of these memes um, and, um, and individual feeds that um, I just don't find useful at all. I think they're garbage. Um, but that's the space where they are, and that's the space where they communicate, and, and I'm... I'm, I'm reaching a point where I say that's part of the conversation, that's part of the structure that starts a conversation flowing at a more elementary level. Um, if you are familiar with Chemistry Cat at all, um, and the types of memes that go back and forth there, um, there's really some powerful um, learning that can happen if you really study those memes and and recognize, oh, they're they're actually really seriously talking about chemical nomenclature in there. They're trying to make funnies with it, but um, I think it was Clay Shirky who said that um, that law cats are still a creative use of technology that you're not getting when you're just sitting on the couch watching a television set. Um, so so being okay with um, with creativity, even when the creativity seems like it's off topic, or when the creativity um, is is not where you naturally live and not the types of conversations that you naturally have. I think that's one way we can find a path to build greater engagement over time. Uncomfortable spaces. Uncomfortable for us. Yeah, but I think it goes in both ways, right? Yes. Like to like Carolyn said that liminal space is uncomfortable space for people and so mm -hmm. there has to be some sort of buy-in to take a risk for, right. for everyone for everyone not just for um, us as teachers but for students um, the, the, the we're invading one another space as we mm -hmm. try to take um, conversations about our, our the stuff we study and make them more authentic for both of us. That's very good. We are invading our space. I think that's really a good thing. It's really true, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I'm I'm not even I'm ju I'm just running my mouth here. I'm not I, like I said. These are fresh ideas in my mind. I'm know that um I know that some of my old running my mouth in front of a room of students isn't going to, to work. It's not going to be as effective. That probably was never as effective as I think it was. Um, so I'm going to have to try to extend conversations in different ways. And this is a thought that's going through my head. Um, I will tweet about how it goes. <laughs> we'll be watching. Okay. Awesome. All right, folks. Well, maybe I'll go ahead and stop the broadcast now, um, unless someone has something burning that they'd like to add here at the end. If not, I'm sure our, our conversations, as Chuck said, will continue uh, in spaces like Twitter. So I'm going to stop the, the broadcast, and then we can say our goodbyes.